Hello, and welcome back to the Pragmatic Alchemy Podcast. I am your host, Courtney Edwards, and today we have welcomed a new guest. I will be talking today uh, with Laura Westman, who is a professional certified coach and a podcaster, and uh, we are going to really spend the bulk of today talking about creativity, um, because that is Laura's uh, area of specialization in, in the various coaching endeavors um, that she participates in. I will also give a quick plug, although I know you'll talk about it, um, Laura, but um, West of Wonderland is where you can find Laura and her co-host Bay on a regular basis. Um, I have I have some things to say about oh, wow. <laughs> without jumping too far into it. Um, there is a show called Octonauts and ah! it is a Disney property. <laughs> I should have so, um, <laughs> so listeners, um, if you check out, I think that was called Dark Magic. I think it was Dark was Magic. Was that episode yeah. called uh-huh. Dark Magic? Um, it's about three episodes ago. Um, my kids loved that show when they were preschool age. It was so much fun. Oh. It was about this little traveling band of animals that lived in a submarine and had to solve different questions and problems about various uh, deep water species. And I learned, <laughs> I learned so much, but they were the octonauts. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so, so we didn't invent it is what you're saying is we didn't create okay, it, right, right, right. but we a little bit. Did. But it killed me. And I, I could, I mean, it was a long time ago. My kids started high school yesterday. So this, this was a while ago that they were preschoolers, wow. but um, I'm 95% sure it was a Disney Disney Junior show. Okay, I it think could it have been Nickelodeon, is. but I think it was Disney Junior. So, but anyway, um, now that I've hijacked your intro, <laughs> welcome Laura to the show. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, how you got here, and and let's talk about how creativity impacts our overall well being. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for that introduction. That was actually a really fun way to be introduced, you know. Um, and uh, so I think uh, how how I like to answer that question is to say, um, so I think if you looked me up on social media, if you went to my Instagram, you would see the quote unquote, uh, success story. You know, you'd see like, oh, she's a musician. Oh, she's a coach. Oh, look at all this confidence and expression and joy and creativity, you know? And I think we're all far enough into the era of social media to know that what we get on social media is just one slice. It's like one piece of the puzzle, you know? I am proud to say that given the kind of work I've done in my life around creativity and well-being and my own healing journey that that snapshot of my Instagram is probably more accurate than it's ever been, which is kind of a cool thing to claim and own, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, so I've been a coach uh, it'll be 10 years this fall, my 10-year coach. Yes, congratulations on Thank your you. anniversary. Um, thanks. And it's it's interesting. When I started coaching all those years ago, part of it was because I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. You know, I think that everybody who gets into a support profession has that desire to support others, be of service, have an impact, be part of other people getting to heal and, and live well. And part of how I got there is uh, I was actually a a couple of years out of college um, doing the thing I do to earn money, which is work in a cafe, porn latte art, you know, being with the people all day. (laughs) It's a very like micro creative, you know, thing to be doing. I really enjoyed that Mm -hmm. and I enjoyed hospitality. Um, But I was also teaching improv classes through Washington Improv Theater. And Mm -hmm. uh, improv was something that I came to, it's funny to look back on through the lens of creativity and well-being because um, where I was when I got into improv was maybe six or so years into having pretty bad vocal nodes. Like I couldn't sing. I developed vocal nodes when I was a teenager. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, I think improv was the way that I was still, like I, I hadn't healed my nodes and there was a lot of heartbreak in my space and a lot of sadness and anger about, about that. Um, Mm -hmm. And that loss of something that was so, it was like the, the nucleus of me when I was a kid, you know? Um, Right, right, right. I don't know. That's a very tangible grief. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, um, this is so funny to say, because it's so cute, but um, I don't know if I said this to you when we met in person, um, but I think as a parent, you'll also understand this. When I was 12 uh, at my summer camp, 
my theater camp, I was cast as Annie in the production of Annie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is it. This is the top. Like, it's never getting better (laughs) than this, you know? Um, And it was like, I mean, it's a little bit true, honestly. Like, how does it get any better than that, you know? But like, I think it all. Well, yeah. Like, (laughs) six year old me agrees um, that getting to play Annie anywhere is maybe the pinnacle. It's the dream. Truly. Yeah, Yeah, it it totally is. Thank you for validating this, understanding this. Um, but I think it also just speaks to like how important performing was to me in my life, you know, that like it's something that had always been such a source of joy and part of my natural way of being. And so to have that taken away um, was really tough. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I can understand that. I think I found improv because um, like I didn't see it linearly in this way, but I think in hindsight, mm-hmm. What I can see is that improv was a way that I could be on stage. I could be Mm -hmm. having fun. You're really in the moment. Like the whole point is that you can't control or predict anything, you know? And so that was a really- The ultimate surrender. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And a Mm -hmm. very safe place for someone with inconsistent vocal ability because Mm -hmm. no one's counting on you to produce anything consistently. It's Mm -hmm. like you Mm -hmm. you get to be there. You're part of the team. Whatever happens, happens. People yes it, you know. And so I think in that way, it was like it was a way that I could still really be participating um, from where I was, you know. So Mm -hmm. there are some times when I reflect and I'm like, oh, I was just doing that because it was the only thing I could do. And it's like, that's actually not true. I think I made that choice because I knew I needed to keep performing. And that is, you know, part of my well-being. And that was the closest thing I could, I could touch comfortably. Yeah. And I, this ties into a question that I have a little bit later. So we're just going to stick a pin in this idea of sort of working from where you are. Yes. You know, I think a lot of people kind of, one of the things that I hear from clients is, you know, if it's not going to be their career or if it's not going to be a quote unquote success by society standards, then it's almost like, well, then it's not worth doing. Um, but I love that idea of just, you know, this helps me kind of just keep keep my finger on that thing that is so important to me and and, and that that is as valid as mm-hmm. somebody who makes their career. I mean, I talk about the singing or yeah, acting or like something. In, yeah, yeah. in my creative groups and um, it's also just very close to my heart, obviously, you know, how much um, the more that you grow into adulthood. We talk about this on West of Wonderland all the time, just how you know, part of what happens when we become adults is that the things that we enjoy doing suddenly have questions about value because we have other responsibilities that are calling for our time and attention and resources. And so it almost becomes this thing where in our adult lives, it's like we have to justify our creative passions by having them be, you know, consumable or good (laughs) or... Or at least like quantifiable or, or monetized in some way. Yes, yeah. exactly yeah. that, yep. you know, yep. and so uh, we'll definitely, we definitely have to loop back on this. I care a lot about yeah. it, you know, yeah. I think yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. the, um, just to close this loop, um, I started teaching improv and um, mm-hmm. I taught a lot of different levels, but my favorite was level one because you have just this eight week experience of watching adults come alive. Mm-hmm. And I just remember practicing applying improv principles into my day-to-day life and really encouraging my students to do that too. And I was like, this is kind of magical. Like things change when you yes and yeah. yourself and your ideas and other people. And um, I just got really curious about like, is is this my career? And there's not a lot of career opportunity in being an improv teacher. And so like, <laughs> but that, that line of thinking about like watching people come alive is what brought me to coaching. And so okay. I had this mm-hmm. very sweet, simple, intentional idea where I was like, I'm going to coach people during the day and I'm going to do improv at night and that's going to be my life. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. uh I got really, I I also started my coaching practice at what I think I would refer to as like the height of hustle culture. Yes. Yes. You know, I did get, I spent the first, I mean, the first couple of years of your practice, um, it does take a lot of energy and effort, you know, um, and so I really had, I, you know, I really like poured all of me into that and kind of let go of the creative parts of me. Um, and there were some consequences to that. So Mm -hmm. This is one of those things where I think part of what really spoke to me about your podcast and the conversations that you're in is like the link between 
you know, these like big picture conversations about well-being and vision, and then like the very small practical day-to-day uh, things that we can do that really build that relationship and kind of like grow that larger thing. This is a big theme on West of Wonderland too, is kind of the mm-hmm. relationship between like the big stuff, the small stuff, and how much the small stuff really matters, you know? Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And I think uh, a couple of years ago, um, when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is my mm-hmm. constant companion these many years. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is anxiety, so it's nice. Everybody, you know, it's nice to be able to recognize that everybody kind of has a has everyone, a little friend. Everyone's that's, got a little friend. It's so true. Tagging along behind them, just keeping life interesting. It's so true. Like my Hashimoto's <laughs> underneath her skirts, she has like anxiety and chronic fatigue, and she has like <laughs> depression sometimes. And there's like a number of different little yeah. children like hiding under her billowing <laughs> skirts. <laughs> she's she's the complete package. Truly, that's she is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But it's it's also like. I think spiritually very interesting to me that my autoimmune disease is of the same part of my body that my vocal nodes also occur. Correct. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, yeah. And throat chakra and all that. Yeah. We start like going very deep into that whole, uh, sort of, you know, view of what's, what's kind of happening at that, yeah. that part of your body in your energy centers there. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's, it's so interesting just in that same line of like the big picture and the small picture, how like a lot of my really like reawakening and reconnection with my creativity, um, while it was in service of something larger, which arguably I'm mm-hmm. living into now, which, I mean, we're always living into something, you know, but, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. the, extent to which the daily small steps just like that connection to my throat chakra to my ability to express myself but also to just be honest with me you know on a Mm -hmm. day-to-day basis Mm -hmm. those are really small things that are like not that sexy you know right but they well I I I feel like they are actually okay I want to lean I'm like yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. I'm like this is the sexiest content ever like (laughs) The nitty gritty of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, true. That's yeah. true. I just say like maybe this is just more speaking to the coaching industry and the world of of coaching yes, where it's that like, I can understand. People like, get so much more seduced by like, um, you know, what are the daily things that you can do that are like catapulting you into that big picture? And it's like actually sometimes right. the most meaningful, sometimes the most creative moments and opportunities are purely from what's right here in front of you you know, so. Which kind of leads, I have a few questions, as I mentioned, and one of them um, that I had wanted to kind of talk about a little bit is, is what, talk to me about your perspective on the intersection between creativity and play. Mm. Because we don't play as adults and shockingly um, not as much as children. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. kids don't even play the way that I remember playing as a child, um, the way that our educational structures uh, have shifted. But but definitely into adulthood, we don't play. Um, And I'm just curious, do you see that as a function of or do you you see playfulness and creativity as related and how? Oh, it's a magical question. Um, I think first. Uh, can you connect to the feeling of being a kid and playing like the most pure? Uh, yeah. Like once every six years, like <laughs> I'll have an experience or I'll be like, oh, this is play. Actually, I, I will tell a quick, quick story. This just happened um, recently and there's a little melancholy tinge to it. But um, my husband and I just celebrated our anniversary and we were after dinner, we took a walk on the Ashokan Rail Trail. And uh, the Asopus is just so, well, probably not now because we've gotten buckets of rain in the last couple of days, but this was a couple of weeks ago and it was so, so dry. And I wanted to get down to the banks of the Asopus to take a picture of how dry it was, but it was also kind of pretty because the sun was setting and it was just sort of like a very cool moment. I was like, well, I want to get down there. So we had gone out to dinner, like fancy dinner. I'm like in my like fancy dinner clothes and I'm scooting down a dirt hill on my butt <laughs> to try to get down there and get this picture. And I tend to be... I tend to be kind of the the supervisor of our family. Like I tend to be the one that keeps everybody on track and on task and we've got stuff to do. And I, I just, 
I embody hustle a little bit. And so my husband is just like standing at the top of the rail trail, just shaking his head in disbelief because I don't think he's ever seen me scoot anywhere <laughs> ever. <laughs> and particularly when I'm not, you know, when I'm dressed in my nice going out clothes. But it just, I was like, I want to get this picture. And it just felt very freeing in that moment to be like, you know, fuck it. I'm going to get a little bit dirty clothes wash like because I do I have nice going out clothes but they're all machine washable because I don't mess around like I mean, yeah so oh, totally, for sure. <laughs> yeah so so yeah so that was you know just a couple of weeks ago very much a fun playful moment of just I was like I'm gonna let go of all convention and I'm gonna get down this hill and get this picture if it kills me that is such a wonderful example and I really want to also <laughs> just acknowledge like the vulnerability of being seen scooting for the first time by your <laughs> Your sweetie pie. In my married life. Yeah, 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 I yeah. Mean, it, it's one of those things. It's, this is like such a small thing that is so Im- meaningful, you know, because I think that to your point, you know, we have so many fewer reasons, opportunities, safe spaces to play, you know, in our adult lives. And sometimes mm-hmm. the less frequently we do it, the more afraid we get of the vulnerability mm-hmm. that's going to come with it, of actually being seen in that exquisite playful scooting you know yes yeah so. yeah and I've heard it described I think because I always like to give credit where credit's due and I'm pretty sure it was on an episode of we can do hard things uh Glennon Doyle and, and sister and Abby's podcast um where they were talking about the abandon that is required by play mm. and I do see that as a through line with creativity and, and you're calling it vulnerability. I'm calling it abandon. I think they're the same thing, yeah. which is the letting go of yeah. and just the freedom For that sure. exists yeah. when we let down all of our guards and just show up authentically and how we can we we are more creative from that place and we can be playful mm-hmm. from that place. Mm-hmm. Right. For sure. Well, and it's um, it's so interesting, this question you've posed about just the relationship between creativity and play and playfulness, because like um, some of my work is in really helping people kind of release the trappings of the perfectionism that we've lumped on to our creative talent and our creative voice. Yes. Yes. You know, and um, what I love about play is it's something that I think, um, number one, it's sometimes one of the greatest access points to our creative genius. And it is my belief. I'll just own this is the hill that I will die on is like (laughs) every single one of us has an inner creative genius. Mm -hmm. We all do. And Mm -hmm. we just all Mm -hmm. have a different relationship to that part of us. Some of us also have Mm -hmm. maybe raw talent, you know, that also gets, gets lumped in with that inner creative genius, but they are distinct. You can have creative genius without being particularly proficient at an instrument or a yes. great singer or, a, you know, a naturally talented art- artiste. Like, the, you know, the, that inner creative genius is is innately part of us and part of our spirit and part of who we are. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, I think when we're kids, uh, we have so much more access to that creative genius. Like there are you know, literal activities in school that ask that creative genius to be busy and to create mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. to be occupied and learn things and practice. And then during playtime, at least like when you said that about childhood play, I was like, the place it took me was like being barefoot in the grass in the backyard and like running around with fireflies. And um, I don't know about you, but for me, for some reason, you know, during the like background, I'm um, sorry, backyard playing years there was this phrase we used in imaginative play all the time pretend like pretend mm-hmm. like pretend like yep. pretend like pretend like you know and yep. so this yep. this imagination is just effortlessly available to us you know mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and i do believe that sometimes if we're actually just willing to follow some of those little playful impulses it changes the nature of what we do it also changes the nature of how we're being and it it has an impact outside of us you know like I Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very small example if we're actually just taking your scooting for example like what a great choice you made you know you followed it all the way through you're like scoot 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 scoot, click or press you know for as the case (laughs) yes yes yeah yeah, no click I didn't have my real camera with me okay yeah (laughs) um and then like but the sheer loveliness and the impact that that then gets to have with your husband and like who he's now going to be in that moment as a function of that playfulness 
that was part mm-hmm. of your creativity, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. I think there's a really powerful relationship there. Um, or even think about it in a, just a very like everyday moment, you know, if I'm in the kitchen and I'm cooking or something, um, if my husband Cody comes in and is playful or silly or starts dancing or makes a funny joke or something, it does also change how I'm feeling, how I'm being. Um, Mm -hmm. there is something Mm -hmm. beautiful that then gets, gets opened up just right there in the energy of how we're, of how we're being. Is this making sense? It does. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. It sure does. I also think that like the abandon, the playfulness, the vulnerability of that, um, also makes it safe for creativity to live. Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, I agree. West of Wonderland, for example, um, I love my podcast. It brings me the most joy. It is like the <laughs> most wonderful project that I've ever taken yes. on. Yes. Um, I kind of feel the same about this one. So I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah it's like yes. greater than the sum of its parts somehow. And it's, yeah, I'm having a blast it's with like this. A little, it's like in a different category for me than my own music, which is to me like, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's a whole other really powerful space creatively for me but it's it just scratches a different itch right so to speak. right um mm-hmm. but that west of wonderland was really born from bay and i met each other through our community of coaches through accomplishment coaching a lot of people over mm-hmm. the years were like oh you and bay you would really get along and we're both leos so we're both like no like there can only be one <laughs> you know and like it's like hilarious how when we finally met and spent time together we were like oh Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what they were talking about. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we actually had yep. a standing weekly connection call where we talk about our businesses mm-hmm. and just, you know, talk about stories and imagination and Disney parks and all the stuff that we love together. Um, mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. from maybe two years of just like spending time together in that way that we, the idea for West of Wonderland was born. And it was such a, you know, vulnerable moment to actually like allow Mm -hmm. that creativity to take shape because you're you're shifting a partnership from having no stakes to suddenly having lots of structure and stakes and you know but also expectations and yeah Yeah. commitment So a couple of minutes ago, when you were talking, you kind of addressed um, one of the other questions that I had, but I want to come back to it because it's an area where I I feel like people really get stuck. Um, And it's this idea of, um, and the the parallel I always draw is, um, like when I ask people what their spiritual practice is, they immediately say to me, I don't go to church. And I'm like, "Mm, same thing. Um, So talk to me about creativity versus being artistic. Because when I talk to clients about how are you engaged in creativity in your life, they'll say, well, I'm not artistic at all. And how do we dispel that rumor that they have to be the same thing? Amazing question. Oh, I love this question. Okay. So I think that um, what comes to mind immediately when you kind of bring up this, this distinction between creativity and being artistic. The first thing that I think of is that being artistic is um, sometimes the the phrase, like the actual use of that phrase, artistic, I am artistic, I'm not artistic, um, 
it is actually a judgment about the quality of something that we're doing. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. you can't. It, and so, I use judgment in kind of a specific way, like not to. It's not a when we're judging something, we're innately. It's like an evaluation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. Is this or it isn't that? You know. Right. And right. So innately, there's some separation from the thing that we've created because we're assessing it, we're evaluating it for its goodness or its artisticness or its whimsy or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's inherently like some assessment and judgment involved in it. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I mean, I've fallen into that mindset myself. Um, for example, you know, having taken the Holland self-directed search or the strong interest inventory in the past, and I always score really high on artistic, you know, so my mm-hmm. Holland score is an S-A-E, which is, I'm always like, how is A my second? Like, I'm not, I'm not artistic, right? But I've come to realize, particularly through having my own business, that I am very creative. And it took me a really long time to kind of link those things, even in my own mind, you know, to be able to be like, yeah, like, no, I can't, I can't draw, I can't paint, I can't, I mean, I can, I can physically um, sing, um, although it's loudly and off key and in my car most times. But but you know what I mean? Like, it's not an artistic endeavor that I'm going to do. I played clarinet badly until I was 14, like that kind of stuff. Um, but I do, I have through this business really tapped into my creative side. Um, and so it's an interesting distinction. Um, and I think it's really important for people to kind of be able to, even if that's the takeaway from this conversation, to understand that you can uh, feel creative and engage in creativity and it doesn't have to be artistic kind of hopping back actually um to your podcast and and the the octonaut episode (laughs) that i referenced (laughs) before one of the things that you and bay were talking about that i was like nodding along with enthusiastically (laughs) was this idea of curiosity and wonder Mm -hmm. and how those relate to creativity because those to me are also fundamental spiritual practices Yes. To experience yes. wonder and to experience curiosity. And how does that connect with creativity in a more profound way than even being artistic might? What do you we think are so that? on the same wavelength because I just wrote all of this down to say, <laughs> okay, so. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's so exciting to me. So um, I, I do also think it's important, you know, if I'm, I did sort of like, like define the the like being artistic as like a form of judgment and like self-categorizing and there's sometimes there's some identity (laughs) in that you know for Um, sure but I do also think that like the one of the distinctions between being artistic and creativity that's really important is that creativity is really about making choices and enjoying and finding delight and play and uh joy in some of that choice making and the creation of anything, you know? So Mm -hmm. like, it might be as simple as, um, oh, I'm going to make chicken and broccoli for dinner. And then it's like, well, how do I kick it up a notch? Like just for the sake of, just for the sake of like enjoying dinner differently. That's right. This is why I'm chefing more than baking, by the way, because baking doesn't always allow for a lot of that because it's very strict and regimented. I don't really enjoy that. I like chefing because I want to like smell (laughs) the seasons and be like, this smells like it would taste good in here and just throw a handful of it in. (laughs) And then you can just follow your intuition and see what works, you know? I know there have been many episodes of West of Wonderland where I've outed myself as like kind of a terrible baker mostly because I like the fantasy of how something will come out Mm -hmm. but I don't put in the time to practice (laughs) and with baking (laughs) and decorating that's all that matters correct yeah yeah that's a whole other thing you know but I will say that like um you know I think one of the core tenets of West of Wonderland we talk a lot about um imagination Mm -hmm. um and leadership and one of the 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 things that we talk a lot about is actually this very underrated relationship with wonder and awe mm-hmm. as part of how we inspire and motivate people when we're leading, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And um, I know that's sort of like a large topic, but I hope that um, – I hope you'll come back again and we'll talk about that more. <laughs> that's oh gosh, I'd whole, love to. <laughs> that's its whole own so episode. <laughs> Yeah, and well, and also, um, kind of a lo- just along the same lines, um, I saw this Mr. Rogers quote. Someone put a reel somewhere on Instagram of um, this interview Mr. Rogers did, 
Um, and it was just this, he was just sharing this very simple, um, thought, which is, you know, he's like, you know, as a society, we're so obsessed with information Mm -hmm. and we're so obsessed with information and we don't really have a lot of places in our society where the point is to feel wonder Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to feel awe. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think it's such an important part of our well-being to be able to look at a tree outside our window and be so and just marvel at the uh, beauty of it and the age right. of it and what it's seen and you know yeah. where it will what it will see after I leave this house like um and mm-hmm. uh it's hard to explain the impact of that on our lives you know mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. this is sort of one of the challenges of a more spiritual or feminine um approach to leadership life any mm-hmm. of it, you know, is it's kind of intentionally unquantifiable. Yes. But you yeah. know, yeah. you know that there is a quality in you that is shifting, that is shining when you connect with things like that. Right. It right. doesn't happen when you don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that whole experience with the tree is the hallmark of my gratitude practice, um, which is the thing that has saved and changed my whole entire life. I mean, it's the cornerstone of who I am and how I make it through this world, (laughs) you know, is by practicing Mm -hmm. gratitude. And for me, I can't practice gratitude if I don't practice awe and wonder Mm -hmm. because you have to stop and just marvel at the tiniest, littlest thing and not Mm -hmm. wait for the big stuff that we count as a victory because those are just too far, you know, few and far between and often so deeply out of our control. But it is 100% in our control to walk out the door and notice the tree. Yeah, and, totally. Like we can do that every day. We can make that choice every single day. Oh, that's so powerful. Yeah, yeah. So with our last couple of minutes left, tell me your advice, your best advice, because um, we have to always make sure we touch on the pragmatic part of this alchemy. But what is your your best advice um, or suggestions for folks who are telling me or telling you or telling us or telling themselves that they don't have time? Mm. They don't have time to have creativity in their lives. What's your response to that? (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, I would say maybe you don't have time to spend two hours a day practicing piano. That may Mm -hmm. be true for you. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, The good news is nobody is limiting you when it comes to the exploration of your creativity. And so it's actually your choice to make it about time or not. Mm Mm-hmm. The example I gave before about um, the changing up of the chicken, yeah, that took that that takes like whoa, a couple extra minutes of research and engaged in an activity that you'd already already be you doing anyway. Already be doing, right? It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You're already so, cooking dinner. Yeah, yeah. So I would say, like, look, if you're stressed about not having time to do things that are creative, I would say, let yourself actually start small, you know, like Mm -hmm. to use your words, really work with where you are, start with where you are. What is the little sprinkle of pixie dust you can put on one activity you're already up to Mm -hmm. that'll have Mm -hmm. it call forth your creativity, make it a little extra special. And it's likely that the more you're practicing that, the more you're going to want to explore that energy. So Mm -hmm. it's almost like the very, the very act of you know, kicking up your chicken notch, um, likely you're going to start doing it more. Can't help. We're losing you a little bit. No. I think our, okay, am I back? Yeah. Can you hear me again? Okay. Yeah, you're back. You're back. Okay, good. Um, but I think we got, I think we got most of it. Sprinkle okay, pixie dust. Yeah. Yeah, just a little <laughs> bit, you know? Or maybe it's just no, as but... simple as like uh, maybe your morning coffee If you have, okay, this is just a very specific example, but if you have, I have, for example, a Breville uh, espresso machine. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a little one. It's called Express Barista. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. um, with a little extra effort, I can steam milk for a cappuccino and -hmm. have a cappuccino in the morning instead of just my really quick iced Americano, et cetera. And it's one of those things where just the very choice of like, oh, I'm actually going to create something a little more special for me changes who I'm going to be that whole day. And it didn't really take that much time. Right, right. And and you have developed the skill to draw yourself fun little 
figures in the foam? Yes or no? Uh, yes. Yeah, but it's hard when it's not an industry grade okay. machine. It's okay, like, okay. So I can okay. sometimes at home I manage a heart, not not as much as I wish okay. I could. It okay. like pains okay. me a little bit. I know. It's to the point where like when we first moved up here, I was even like, should I like get hired for one shift a week at a coffee shop just to like <laughs> just enjoy to do the that? pleasure? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I love it. I love yeah. it. Oh, this was such a fun conversation, um, and I really would love to come back to it because I think there's a few more directions that we could probably probably take that down. But we are just about out of time for today. Uh, Laura, where can people find you if they want to connect with you or learn more about your work or listen to your podcast? Yes, yes, yes. Well, if you have Instagram, uh, you can find me at Westy Graham, W-E-S-T-Y-G-R-A. M-M-E-D is my personal account. I share a lot of music and a lot about my work and also a lot of pictures of my cat and dog. You can't yes. escape them. And lots of trees. Um, my podcast, West of Wonderland, is also on Instagram at West of Wonderland Podcast. And you can find us on any of the major platforms where you like to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, and my website is laurawestman.com. Um, there's also a secret hidden page I'll tell you about if you're ever interested in doing Ooh. my creatives group. Um, it's laurawestman.com slash academy. Like it's not linked on my formal page. You kind of okay. have to know where to look. But that's where to look if you're curious. Excellent. 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 And I will put links to all of those in the show notes uh, so people can find you there and and click more easily to track you down and see what creative endeavors you are sharing with the world. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. This was such a fun conversation and and, um, I'm hoping that folks really find a moment today, tomorrow, the next day to just kind of tap in, just briefly tap into that creative spirit that you that you do have. We promise you that you do have it inside and sprinkle that fairy dust wherever you can. Uh, thanks for being with us today. I'm looking forward to being back uh, next week. We've got some more fun guests lined up. Um, find us wherever you find your podcasts and don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you think your people will love this content, please share it with them. And if you have topic ideas or questions that we can answer on the air, you can send those to Courtney at shineandsore.com or fill out the contact form on shineandsore.com backslash podcast. We'll see you again real soon. Take care of yourselves and each other.